Hello and welcome to Lore of the Cards, the series that looks to reveal the lore hidden in your Hearthstone deck. Today, we'll be having a bite-sized episode, looking at a couple of cards people have expressed interest in. But don't worry, we'll have a nice long episode next time. We'll be looking at two cards with a little lore behind them, the Mage Legendary Anomalous and the Shaman Legendary Halazeel the Ascended. Let's start with Anomalous. The art was produced by Can Liu, currently misspelled in Hearthstone as Can Lui, a Chinese artist whose work this expansion included the Carrion Grub, and whose Vulgin art I adore, using it quite a bit in my Vulgin episode. 10,000 years ago, the War of the Ancients raged. The Burning Legion, seeking to eradicate all they see, invaded the world of Azeroth. At this time, the Old Gods also released a monstrously destructive weapon upon Azeroth's inhabitants, Deathwing. Through maddening whispers, the Old Gods had driven the mighty dragon aspect Neltharium mad, and the insane dragon created the Dragon Soul, later known as the Demon Soul, to obliterate all who defied him. Malagos, the blue dragon aspect, took Neltharion's betrayal the most to heart, having considered the Black Dragon a great friend. Malagos and his flight attacked Deathwing, but the power of the Dragon Soul almost saw the entirety of Malagos' flight wiped from the face of the Earth, including his prime consort, Sindracosa. Mourning the loss of his flight, Malagos was driven mad by despair. The blue aspect and many of his surviving flights secluded themselves within their lair of the Nexus. Malagos was rarely seen venturing out, only leaving to come to the aid of Alex Straza to defy Deathwing and free the Red Dragon Queen from her Orc captivity. It all sounds very exciting, doesn't it? Don't worry, I really do want to cover the dragon aspects in more detail soon. Malagos' seclusion and madness would continue until just before World of Warcraft's Wrath of the Lich King expansion. With clarity restored, the aspect that had been trusted by the Titanic Watchers to safeguard the magic and arcana of Azeroth surveyed the world. He came to a dismal conclusion. One of Malagos' final memories before his insanity was the highborn Night Elves' reckless overuse of magic, attracting the Burning Legion to the world. Now, Malagos again saw the mortal races using the arcane arts with reckless abandon, and came to the conclusion that their abuse of magic was unacceptable. Malagos declared war on all spellcasters among the lesser races, the majority of his ire being directed at the mage city-state of Dalaran. To ensure he could more closely monitor the flow of magic, Malagos used a device called the Arcanomicon. This titanic device acted as a map for all the magical ley lines and their intersections within Azeroth. Using it, Malagos was able to redirect many of these ley lines to beneath his lair, sending the magic up through the Nexus and out into the Twisting Nether, a realm of chaotic magic existing between worlds. This came with consequences. The land around his home, concentrated with so much magical energy, became unstable. Splits and tears rupturing the earth. Malagos' attempts to correct the mortal spellcaster's magic had turned to the dragon himself misusing magic. It became clear that Malagos needed to be stopped. The other dragon aspects saw that their brother, who would no longer listen to reason, needed to be dealt with. With their assistance, heroes of the Alliance and Horde entered Malagos' domain to put a stop to the aspect. Venturing into the lower depths of the Nexus, the heroes sought to rescue Kerastraza. The Red Dragon was forced into becoming Malagos' consort for her role in killing his previous consort, Saragossa. Travelling through the Nexus, the heroes discovered that the redirected magic had not just split the crust of Azeroth, but had caused tears in the very fabric of the magical dimension. Unstable portals had formed, guarded by Malagos' forces, preventing the arcane elementals that escaped from running amok. But there was one that could not be contained. A giant of pure arcane energy, Anomalous. If left unchecked, Anomalous had the potential to become a supremely destructive being, destroying all that it touched. Recklessly, the heroes charged at the arcane anomaly. Anomalous was able to weaken the champion's resistance to the arcane school of magic and would frequently hurl arcane bolts at his foes. While Anomalous's power was formidable, it was his instability that made him even more terrifying. In the presence of the elemental, further tears appeared, delivering a constant stream of reinforcements to Anomalous's side, unless those tears were closed. When threatened, Anomalous could channel his power into a tear, making the elemental immune and increasing the power that radiated from it, weakening the heroes. Eventually, the spindly arcane Hulk was defeated. 
The reason Anomalous is a Mage Legendary should be obvious. He is a physical manifestation of the very power that a mage wields. What confuses me a little more is why Anomalous was added in Whispers, as the Elemental has no connection at all to the Old Gods. In gameplay, Anomalous's card power is a great way of depicting his instability within a game mechanic. Now that we know of the events that led to Anomalous's creation and a little about the creature itself, let's move on to our second card. Halazil the Ascended. His art was created by Wayne Reynolds, an artist responsible for many legendary cards. Ken, Antinidus, Bolf, Thorisan, and Malganis are all Reynolds' work. During World of Warcraft's Cataclysm expansion, the Twilight's Hammer Cult were one of the main organisations fought by the heroes of Azeroth. The cult were worshippers of the Old Gods, committed to freeing their masters and bringing about the end of the world. Their tactics frequently bent the elements of Azeroth in sick and depraved ways, taking what they needed from the elements by force. Those held in the highest regard among the Twilight's Hammer were selected for the process of ascension, which transformed mortal beings into powerful elementals. Not much is known of the process from those outside the cult, but it seems to drain power from other elementals or even demigods to achieve the horrifying results. Members selected for ascension were chosen by the Ascendant Council. While not necessarily the first descendants, they were certainly the most powerful and had been transformed long enough to have forgotten their mortal existence. Each member of the council represented the four prime elements of Azeroth. Feludis, Water, Ignatius, Fire, Arian, Air, and Terrastra, Earth. Their lair sat deep within the Twilight's Hammer's base of operations, the Bastion of Twilight, just before the cult leader's throne room. But you'll find out more about them next episode. Let's look at some of the most notable Ascendants selected by the Council. The Shaman Deseric the Depraved's devotion to the cult and his love for cruelty saw him selected for his new form, Ascendant Lord Obsidius. Obsidius oversaw the Twilight's Hammer's operations within the Black Rock Caverns. At the behest of one of the Old God's oldest servants, Deathwing, elementals were transported from Mount Hyjal to the depths of the Black Rock Mountain, where they were experimented upon. These experiments saw some cultists being transformed into Twilight Dragonkin. Twilight Lord Bathiel oversaw mass sacrifices within Black Fathom Deeps. Once a temple of the Night Elves dedicated to their worship of the Moon Goddess Alun, it was now the staging ground for the awakening of one of the Old God's favoured pets, Akumai. Ember Scar the Devourer was the final challenge of the Crucible of Carnage questline that saw heroes taking on a series of increasingly difficult foes in a brutal arena. Not that big a deal of an Ascendant in terms of lore, but that's some damn fine art. Finally, Halazeel the Ascended. Halazeel led a group of the Twilight's Hammer to the underwater region of Vashir. Here, they discovered an ancient demigod, the giant mollusk Lagorek, assumed to be a being similar to Malorn, one of the wild gods. Somehow, Halazeel and his followers found a way inside the giant being and began the process of Halazeel's ascension. Lagorek's huge heart was severed from its arteries, and in the giant cavern left behind, the Twilight's Hammer built a large temple. Within this temple, Halazeel's ascension ritual took place, draining power from Lagorek to achieve his new form. Heroes were also able to make their way inside the giant demigod disturbed by the Twilight's Hammer activity. They found a way of communicating with the dying demigod, and Lagorek implored the heroes to help drive Halazeel's Twilight's Hammer from him, to prevent his power from being used for ill purpose. Lagorek told the heroes the ascendants created within his body were to be used in an imminent war between the Old God's forces and the forces of the Elemental Lord, Neptulon. With direction from Lagorek, the heroes stopped many of the Twilight Cult from ascending, and collected runestones of binding from slain acolytes. Lagorek attuned the runestones to allow the hero to take control of one of the huge elementals that stood outside the Hammer's Temple, that was bound to their will. With the bound torrent, the hero slaughtered many of the Twilight Cultists, and made their way inside the temple. Within, they found Halazeel an ascendant far greater in size than many others. While having the appearance of a water elemental, the element literally dripping from him, Halazeel did not fight using water-based spells, 
but arcane. I have a couple of theories as to why this might be. Perhaps, despite his imposing form, Halazeel had not quite fully ascended, and as a result, wielded magic from his mortal form. The second, and I think probably more likely theory, is that because Halazeel drew his power from a demigod, his abilities differed from that of other ascended. Halazeel was defeated, and upon hearing the good news that the Twilight's hammer had been driven from his body, Lagorek also died. Halazeel's card likely plays upon its power absorption, benefiting your hero with healing when spells are played, turning something already powerful into something even greater. Playable Shaman in Warcraft are now able to turn into Ascendants as well, but their ascension is temporary. This implies the elements willingly bind with the Shaman to offer them aid in a time of need, boosting their powers. So, there you have it, the lore behind two legendaries that really don't have all that much lore behind them. I really hope you enjoyed. If you did, we'd really appreciate you liking, subscribing and sharing with your friends, helping the six gamers ascend to the coveted form of YouTube famous. Of course, if you think we're corrupt with power and deserve to be consumed by it, you can always hit the dislike button. We're also on Twitter, at the six gamers and Facebook, forward slash six gamers UK. Either way, until next time, happy hearthstoning.